Hi, I'm Shayma Cosme. I'm a thoracic oncologist at CTCA. COVID-19 is a very, very unprecedented, very contagious disease that has um, taken up, obviously, the entire world by storm. Adapting this to another very, very serious illness, which is cancer, has been a challenge. The risk and benefit weighing is really has never been more important than now. So what I have done and, and what we're all trying to adapt to is, is multiple questions that come to the forefront of what the right thing to do is. What, what are the procedures that we can safely delay or avoid completely? For instance, port placements. Of course, if a port is absolutely essential and there's no venous access, um, then a port may need to be placed. However, if someone can get a peripheral IV for a little while and avoid a surgical procedure, this is more exposure for the patient as well as the staff, I'm trying to do that. The other aspect is really if I need tissue testing for genomic studies, for instance, we would be proceeding with biopsies without any question. However, in, in the COVID world, we have to weigh the risks of that biopsy not only to the patient, to the staff, and this is where liquid biopsy uh, can be used more freely. Um, it's safer for everyone, only involves blood test. So there's been a lot of adaption. Where it gets to be really gray is timing of adjuvant therapy. If you for curative patients with breast cancer, with lung cancer, with colorectal cancer, how safely can we delay their chemotherapy, which we know will make them immune compromised and Certainly, they will have higher complications of COVID-19 if they do and succumb to that disease. So that's not clearly defined. I think it has to be a very individual uh, decision making uh, based on the risk threshold of the patient um, and the physician. And, and really, nobody knows the right answer about those. Certainly, patients in the metastatic setting, we feel a little bit more comfortable um, delaying therapies if need be. However, they're also fighting for their lives so that delaying therapy can, can limit their ability to get future therapy if their disease progresses too much. So while that's not a curative setting, we do have different set of challenges in, in those patients. So this has really been um, really challenging in cancer in different parts of the country have different access to testing. One of the questions that have come up is how about testing? prior to um, procedures or chemotherapies that may be very risky. Testing for COVID sounds like a great idea. However, with turnaround times, testing turnaround times of seven to nine to 10 days, they may not be practical at all because by the time you've tested somebody and you have results, they may have re-exposed themselves in the interim and now you don't know if that result has any validity or value. Um, and, and so that's, and then how often do we test in between cycles? Do we test, test every time? So um, we don't have that quick access test um, and that would be helpful and great. But until then, we we'll all have to make some really difficult decisions. I've incorporated telehealth a lot more in my practice. Um, it's been a, a really tremendous amount of growth in my learning technology as well as my patients. A lot of the time, initially, I'm, I'm more of an IT tech with my patients and, and less a uh, physician. But it's been um, an, a really, really good way to access technology um, that has always been available to us and not utilized. Not utilized for lots of reasons. Primarily, we are touchy-feely subspecialty. You know, in oncology, I miss touching patients' hands and giving them a hug. It's not just about the treatment and the chemo. It's always been about the caring aspect, and that's been hard. And without that, can a telehealth visit suffice, perhaps, um, where I get to see a patient who I don't really want to touch if I don't have to anyway? Um, so that's been very, very um, different and, and it's been a lot of uh, adoption with technology. Um, most of the time it's worked out well. There's plenty of glitches there. The other aspect of this has also been, we haven't used this before because it wasn't reimbursed. Telephone calls, telehealth visits for physicians are really not re reimbursed at a rate 
of an actual visit, um, regardless of the clinical uh, addition of, of what a physical exam would add. And that's been unfair. I think that that whole billing uh, practice needs to change where we're also, you know, we really ought to be able to bill by the decision making that we're doing with every patient, physical exam or not. And so I think that our time um, is valuable. And I think that this might create a platform where physicians are able to uh, demand uh, appropriate pay for these kinds of visits, even in the future, even after COVID is all gone, this may be a reasonable way to perhaps do second opinion consults and um, perhaps other things that don't necessarily require in-person visit. Um, so our patients have, have had a significant amount of worry and anxiety to begin with. Cancer is a scary, scary disease, as are many other diseases, and um, there's never been any promises, even in early stage cancer, that you're guaranteed to be cured, and cancer is deadly. So worry and anxiety um, go hand in hand with our diagnoses and all our patients. So we're pretty much aware of how to handle those with these patients. A lot of it requires listening, which really, to be honest with you, the telehealth um, uh, really gives you that ability to be able to listen to a patient without interruptions and, and with the luxury of being flexible with timing and no one's rushing to you know, uh, catch their train out or, or their car ride and their next appointment. So I think conversation, talking to patients, also reminding them um, to not listen to everything in social media or what their best intention family or friends may be sending them. Everyone is overnight turned into a COVID expert and, and really has an opinion. And so this amount of overwhelming information, especially when it's contradicting each other, it can really be scary uh, and provoke more anxiety. So I tried to tell them to stay away from a lot of that information. And if you have specific questions, please call us. Um, and we would direct you. The other thing I'm also asking the patients not to do is watch TV all day, and news especially, because it's, it's scary, it's depressing, and it can really add to the anxiety and, and depression that they may already have, especially since you really can't go out and you need to shelter in place. Most people default to that. So what I tried to tell them to do and get some ideas on what things may have enjoyed, they may have enjoyed in the past and try to see if they can um, rekindle some of those interests and try to get their mind off the current status of the world. And, and lastly, I tell them that we're here for them um, and we are not abandoning their cancer journey in, in light of COVID-19. And we're always going to be there once this is all over. And the most important thing is that they care, take care of their safety and we'll make decisions together about what's best for them. So I think that helps most patients um, really um, from a, an emotional perspective. Well, you know, um, I think we are in a very dangerous time of explosion of misinformation. By that I mean patients and, and the public and even physicians are bombarded with misinformation and tremendous extrapolation of a little bit of information from the top down. And I think that the best thing to do and, and ASCO and SITSI and a lot of the larger organizations are doing it already is getting together and creating some guidelines initially for the physicians a platform where they're all following the same level uh, of guidelines and the same sort of rules across the country. And this helps the physicians give the proper advice to patients. So I would say that um, patient advocacy groups really need to emphasize that patients themselves are an individual and they should really not take blanket advice from anyone else except for their own physician, their own team. Uh, of um, doctors, nurses, PAs, NPs who care for them, who are best suited to give them advice in their particular case. So I think that's going to be the biggest message is that um, there's a lot of information. A lot of it is not validated. Most of it is, 
and how do we make, best make decisions for you as an individual using that information? And I think that if we can clear out some of the misinformation out there, I think that would serve our community very well. Yeah, so I am very curious um, to see how COVID-19 um, is, is altered or how it affects an individual who's been on uh, checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy. We can intuitively know that patients who are on chemotherapy with depressed immune systems who, uh, or patients with chronic uh, rheumatological conditions and chronic cancer who have depressed immune systems may have worse outcomes with COVID-19. I'm very curious to see how patients on immunotherapy, which is really a stimulated T cell response, would do um, if they contracted COVID-19. Of course, we don't have enough information in this area, and, and that would be an area I'd wanna really research. I have lots of patients on uh, IOs or um, checkpoint inhibitors, um, and if, if there's enough information um, on these patients who develop COVID, and whether their disease or uh, their symptoms are worse or better than the general population would be very interesting to study. <laughs>